I heard you guys like live demos, so I, I'm sharing a mix of uh, a bunch of stuff uh, today. And uh, it's, believe it or not, it's kind of like my playground a little bit. Um, took me a while to kind of convince myself that, you know, that, uh, you know, that we could be, you know, just solve all these problems, right? Traverse NATs and get the traffic where it needed to go. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of an eBay hardware junkie, you know, 96 gig servers and stuff. So this is literally running a combination of I've got stuff in AWS and Azure, you know, in my, you know, basement storage room and uh, anywhere else I could, you know, headquarters, I guess, um, anywhere else I could scrounge up compute, right? So, I mean, one of the points I guess I'd make is that, um, you know, you can really get your hands on this stuff and kind of get your hands dirty with it. So. Uh, you know, the idea, I guess, was to, you know, go ahead and throw, a, like, a customer scenario out there and say, uh, you, know, what's, you know, what's the challenge we're trying to solve um, in a particular use case, right? And, uh, you know, so here's, here's kind of a real-world use case, right? Uh, migrate to cloud-based services, minimum operational impact and cost, right? You want elastic connectivity, you want to migrate, you know, private data center resources or at least move them between. Uh, in fact, it's kind of interesting because sometimes you find uh, interest in moving it from the cloud to back to private, private to the cloud, or, you know, just depends upon the use case. Uh, we don't want to, you know, leak uh, cloud route. Well, I mean, you may. I mean, you could certainly run BGP and, you know, carry the routes in if you want. Uh, but you may not want to, right? So we hear this from some customers is that, you know, I want to touch these different cloud you know, locations, but I don't want to flap my BGP to do it. I may not want to take all my routes into my small prem routers because I might be full of my routing tables and they're getting kind of old or, you know, I mean, anyway, that's, it's just, you know, try to do this, at, you know, as simple as possible. Um, you know, so sometimes they are interested in symmetry, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to for security services, managed traffic, obviously. Uh, of course, we bring symmetry. I think it's fundamental to the product, um, you know, Prefer to maintain you know, segmentation, you know, go to across different address spaces. You know, whoops, I took the default address space in AWS, and now I might need to add into it or something. Um, you know, and uh, you know, prefer to, uh, you know, again, uh, so need enterprise-wide auditing. We hear this from the cloud teams. They're actually bringing us into uh, opportunities now because, you know, enterprise-wide auditing, accounting, uh, network-wide alerting, um, you know, that can apply to multi-cloud. So, I mean, that's, that's what we're hearing from customers, right? Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, what I've done here is um, I have something called Elastic Services. This is a 120T conductor, um, you know, just kind of a high level. This is, this is like an initial dashboard. You got some events, you got assets, and uh, you can create custom dashboards. Um, you know, and there's a little map there. It gives a bit of, you know, a list of the routers. You can, you can uh, you know, expand these tabs, and, you know, we're showing routers, services, tenants. You know, those are global uh, chunks of the data model. But I'm having this problem, right? I've got this problem of, um, you know, I'm running, uh, you know, yeah, I've got some good load balance traffic. Actually, let me just show you a quick view of the topology. Um, it's, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward. But um, uh, so we're looking at, you know, got a data center, some private data center resources. You know, I'm doing some load balancing of traffic between a couple of locations. Uh, you know, and that's, you know, it's pretty, pretty basic topology. Um, and, uh, you know, and, you know, one of my servers is running really hot, right? So this is just generated traffic, you know, web surfing traffic, file, down, file downloads, uh, you know, but one of these servers is running hot. I got a, I got a server on order, right? But, uh, you know, I need some bandwidth now. And, um, you know, and, uh, and so, got my uh, SSH. The CLI is what? Uh, the uh, if you're on the hotel Wi-Fi, you can't SSH, but there's other ways. So uh, anyway, so now I've got the script called launch, right? And oh, it uh, those are basically no, no, AWS no. instance IDs. That was a question. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the CLI for your controller, or is it just? Oh, I thought you were saying. I thought you were uh, noticing that SSH work because it didn't work on the hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, so let me think here. This controller's running at AWS. Um, some of the, the, but the, but the routers themselves are running like in private data center, and I'm going to add a cloud. No, he was asking so the CLI. The CLI yeah. is your controller, the one you. you no, 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 no. Is cloud. Uh, you're just generating traffic. Are you? Uh, is that shell right there? Uh, is that where's that shell? This is this is a, it's a, it's running on the conductor, but I'm just using shell tools. So this is, um, you know, AWS CLI uh, tools, you know, JSON. I'm just using this to launch an instance uh, into AWS. Um, so it's it does happen to be we running on the one. conductor. It's, it's called 
Yeah. 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 We, we do have a CLI that, that is completely, we can even show you that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but and, I mean, and, and all the AWS stuff you can do point and click in the conductor. Right. I mean, you know, it, I think the DevOps thing is pretty well proven out now, right? I mean, uh, you know, script up, uh, uh, you know, your JSON and and you know, use your cloud-based APIs and, and launch instances. So I could show that part of it, but um, but that's fundamentally what's going on. Um, so uh, and there should be you know initializing right in AWS, right? So. I mean, that's that's that. So, that so you started a new you started a new router. Started a new router. Uh, this one happens to be based in AWS. Could be based in Azure. Um, so again. it's just a new EC2 instance running. Just a new EC2 instance running. Um, actually, I can show you. We do. Um, so I <coughs> fired it up off uh, off the marketplace, which oh, is you did interesting. Marketplace. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you can take you know standard stock image. Um, it's going to come back, and you can you give it a little tag data. Um, it'll say, hey, here's my conductor. Uh, so our standard image takes a little bit of metadata on the way in, and it says, "Oh, I better go check into some other AWS conductor," and you know it'll tell me what to do, right? And uh, and so that's where it's going to go ahead and download the the data model. Um, in fact, one of the things that takes unfortunately long uh, is that um, I'm ahead of the game on my code, and uh, one of the things we could do is uh, you know upgrade the the node as it comes in. Got it. Right. So that's that's actually the longest pole in the tent. Um, as far as time goes. So, but. so your, your intent is people consume it via marketplace, not via self deploy. Correct. In, in Amazon, yeah. In, in Amazon. But you could. No, I understand you, you could. Can. Yeah. The, the point is, is that you prefer folks to consume I, it. I mean, I, you know, whatever works, I guess. I mean, uh, before we were in the marketplace, I was spinning them up, you know, and, and adding our code. Sure, it just means less maintenance on the AMI side. There's, yeah. I, there's a lot of advantages of doing it via marketplace. Yeah. Right. Trying to right. Maintain your yeah, exactly. It's a known starting point. Um, yeah, anyway, so that's, um, uh, you know, that's up and running. Um, we do have a, an asset manager uh, that I could then, uh, one node awaiting assets, I can just, I can get that asset ID and basically commit that to be my asset. And at this point, I've said, all right, I, you know, see kind of the two-factor authentication approach, which says, all right, I know that that asset ID is now matching my expected uh, environment and I can allow that in. You could automate that step if you wanted. Um, uh, but uh, you know that's, that's a little bit of two factor for you. So uh, anyway, that's now gonna go to the background. It's gonna do its thing. Um, if I look back at my asset manager, uh, it's probably looking and looking at, you know, uh, looking at, um, you know, installing. So, uh, that is gonna happen in the background. I've got a couple other demos that are kind of, uh, these are a little bit of the standard uh, 128T, right? Uh, one of these is, you know, okay, so <laughs> we didn't really put ourselves in the SD-WAN market for a long time because uh, it, it was kind of almost to make a point that it's so much more, right? So, um, you know, and at some point, you, know, you can't fight the market, right? So you gotta say, hey, well, uh, you know, SD-WAN, we've got, you know, I, I call them bookended load balancers, but um, you know, but hey, we could do that. Uh, that, that use case. Um, the idea here is you've got. Uh, well, if I can get a refresh and uh, video thing, should allow me to play. And this is the part where, believe it or not, I am on a VPN. And there we go. All right, so uh, we've got you know one of our DevOps extraordinaires you know does the you know kind of the the video, so the idea is that this is going across your traditional circuit A, circuit B, could be MPLS and internet, right? And I mean this is fundamentally the SD WAN use case. Um, you know we're sending video, choosing a link, sending it to the remote router, um, and 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 rendering it. So a little bit of it is like all right. On that? I'm sorry. Are you doing multicast for the video stream? I have multicast in one of my other setups. Uh, we do support multicast, so. This, is, this demo is a unicast, yeah. Yeah, um, remind me and I'll show you. Uh, although I don't know if I really pulled the, that, that video on my laptop, but uh, anyway, so this is, uh, this is doing, uh, you know, internet pass status, we want fast failover. So, you know, take out the internet, you know, but 
A little bit of you know what's going on is different, right? This isn't a tunnel failover. This is the sessions that are affected, right? And you know, and and now we talked about what happens when it goes over the LTE or what happens when it goes over a new path. We transmitted the metadata on the new path, and you know, however it got back to the original egress because you usually want to go around you know the original egress. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get that metadata back to it. It's gonna say, hey, this session's the original session. Um, you know, and, and recombine uh, essentially the flow for um, you know for transmission. So uh, it's very fast failover. I mean, I think that's kind of the point um, of the demo. Um, and you know, you can select based on service which flows are important, uh, or select them all and do you know fast failover for them all. Um, you could have a multi-hop path uh, on the way, which is very, very different than a bookended load balancer. Um, so, um, you know, that's, you know, I think pretty cool. Are you doing any, any type of brownout detection, like failover paths because there's, you know, a certain amount of packet loss or... Yeah, sick but not like, dead. Yeah, is, yeah, sick but not dead. Sick but not dead is, is a giant problem. Yeah, so yes, you know, this is the, the sick, sick but not dead part of it. Um, and I do have to, you know, give it uh, a second because I just I, I waited a little long before I brought the internet path back up. Yep. But you know, we're going to go ahead and uh, and brown it out. And uh, while you're here, how how are you doing this detection? How do you know when it's sick but not dead? Right. So so uh, BFT packets are kind of a fundamental uh, probe packet for our adjacencies. Um, we do piggyback some additional, so we do latency loss and jitter using uh, BFD. Um, we are doing uh, essentially the you know checksum and and uh, uh, we're we're going to be modifying uh, essentially using our own header data to to piggyback uh, some of the the packet loss monitoring so we don't have to do that with separate packets and then that way you're literally running with the same QoS and the same you know everything as the flows that you care about uh, uh, and and so uh, you're monitoring real traffic both. in addition to. Some level of synthetic by by keeping an eye on the yeah. right. If there are no active sessions between any routers, then we switch to the um, then we are doing the BFD. It's an enhanced BFD, so we can monitor delay jitter loss, multi hop BFD. And of course, when we have actual session data, we can we can derive from that what happened, what's happening with the link at that point. Okay. And there's a little bit of uh, you know lag here. It's like how quick do you want to fail over? Like how sick and how dead does yeah. it need to be? Right. So it's kind of like eh, it's getting a little jittery. And, you know. Losing some packets, um, you know, and so at that point we get, you know, we got to make a decision, um, and you know that decision comes you know, as quick as you want it to, I guess, is the best way to put it, um, and uh, you know, and so there's the the brownout condition. That's you know, a lot of folks say, look, I have a whole new product category, SD WAN. So anyway, I mean, uh, brownout also depends on these service SLAs, right? I mean, like whatever SLA you set for that service, yeah. Uh, I've got another one here that you know shows a bit of the uh, you know we, we it was like well, again we kind of needed to prove it or to prove it to ourselves like what's the bandwidth savings so we kind of give you like a choice of encapsulation uh, do I want to run encrypted traffic or not encrypted traffic um, and so I can fire up some live traffic um, that will then you know literally run you know side by side and this is kind of where uh, Ritesh's screenshot came from yeah it's like. Uh, you know, based on packet size, based on encryption, based on header size, you know, it's just uh, it's to show the the savings, and then, you know, again, variable packet size now, as you're actually now this is standard Grafana, right? Using REST API. That's correct. This is not our tool. This right. is an external this tool, just monitoring from yeah. our interfaces and from tradition. Yeah. Yeah, so it's gathering REST data. And no. And all of this is configured centrally. I mean, I don't know that I've seen that yet. So like, yeah, that's from a yeah. Uh, so, well, I've, let's pull up my playground here a little bit. Um, this is my, uh, you know, this is my play topology. And yeah. frankly, I use this to mock up a lot of customer scenarios. If there's something that, you know, that hits me that's different and I just want to try it, um, is what I do. So, got some instances running AWS. Um, you know, I've got, uh, you know, here we are, AWS, show stats. You can get a real quick look at, you know, Late, you know, latency jitter and loss, and you can see it's you know it's live, it's peering with a bunch of other routers. You can get some pretty quick status. Um, you know, I've got another one in Azure. Uh, they're both great partners to us. Uh, we love them both, um, uh, and Google as well. Um, you know, so uh, that's my mobile 128T. It's actually uh, the only uh, 
only one that's down there is in my laptop bag. Uh, <laughs> I, I was going to take a picture of Logan yesterday. I was um, literally, I went through security and I had a call and I wanted to jump on and do a demo. And I was like, man, is the Wi-Fi going to work? Is the LT going to work? And I literally pulled out my thing, threw it on both, sitting in the corner of Logan, you know, doing SD-WAN. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that was kind of, uh, that's why that one's red. But um, uh, so again, custom dashboards, I think, is, is, um, is interesting. Um, these, uh, it, it, so one of the points we make, and I don't know if we made it uh, uh, fully, is that we've got fully distributed uh, analytics data, right, on the router node, right? So um, actually, let me, let me pull that up, and I've got a slide that kind of points that out, but this, okay, oh, here's the, you know, conductor framework, right? So you've got APIs, REST APIs. If you want to push configuration data in, it'll distribute it. It's a global data model. We'll get more into that. Um, you know, true DevOps platform. Um, scalable SSL-based management, right? So you think of controllers, and sometimes you're trying to, um, you know, create connections back to those controllers, and how can I do that in a scalable way? Uh, SSL-based, right? And so now we can, um, there's, what's interesting here is we can live, we can kind of survive between, uh, you know, 128T running and 128T not running, right? So there's, uh, and I don't know, do we talk much about salt tools or? Yeah, you can yeah. talk about it. So, I don't know, it's kind of sometimes we say, well, how would Google do it, right? And they manage a bunch of servers and salt is a nice, uh, nice tool, right? So, uh, you know, so when 128T is not running, we can still have salt running in the kernel. Uh, you know, that'll, that'll phone home, you can push down config data, you can do package management and everything. Uh, and then 128T comes up and that SSL will actually fail back or, you know, migrate back into you know, whatever path you choose, um, any or all paths back to reach management. So it's, it's really nice, I call it resilient, uh, you know, fail to kernel. You can use the interface IP or you can use a logical IP. Uh, uh, for management, and so, uh, and it's only needed for, uh, you know, I say it's, it, the, con the conductor is only really needed for things that change, right? You want to, anything you want to share between routers, uh, which is config data, but, um, you know, again, there could be other I'm address still, updates, things like that. So I'm still a little lost in terms of what, what the config actually looks like or what state yeah. information you actually give out of the 120. Can you go through some of the Yeah. yeah. To the device. Can I go to the conductor? Like, what are you actually provisioning yeah. and setting it up? Uh, so, config. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm all in now on kind of the global data model. Um, there's uh, one cool thing we're doing is multi-authority conductor where we're taking um, essentially uh, a base uh, conductor and then spinning up containers uh, for individual uh, you know, child uh, networks. Could be your own you know, enterprise so, you know, subtenants so or it could be service. A, a word on authority. Authority for us is a, is, is a, a, tech, a, tech, a tech string that is uh, unique to a particular uh, customer. It's like, it's like an autonomous system. Yeah, there's config in there, actually. Yeah. Things, these are like so global to the... To make sure everything's unique glo uh, globally, it's, like, oh, it's right. like the root of a domain name. Well, I did accept the asset, I think. It was, it was configured, yeah. Uh, he's just reminding me to... Uh, if I forget to accept the asset, it doesn't start installing the software. Uh, so anyway, but we're... Uh, yeah, this is, this is, uh, these are all things that are global, right? Routing filters and policies. You may want to have literally global routing policies that could be shared across all routers. These could be, you know, BGP policies. You might uh, want to share conductor addresses, IP fix collectors, things like that. Those are literally uh, just, just global uh, configuration items. Um, routers, right, are global configuration items. Um, but the difference here is that now routers contain things like, like service routes. Um, you know, uh, they could, uh, you know, but they don't have to contain the, the tenants and services that apply globally, right? So they can literally, uh, you know, we'll say inherit that. So it becomes almost more like an interface container. Um, if you have an HA node, um, it contains both nodes, right? So you've got, and I just call this service function chain because the test I was doing at that time was service function chaining. Um, but those are two nodes. Right, and those nodes can have their own transports. So you could put LTE on one, and you know, broadband on another, uh, and MPLS on the other. Um, you know, and so then they're doing stateful synchronization of flows. Um, you know, they act in you know, and, and they'll they'll have a crossover, essentially a crossover link that if you if you wanted to fail over to the other transport and refresh metadata out the other. The, do they have the concept of a shared certificate? Or are you guys doing some sort of shared certificate for that flow? In order, because you said you're populating metadata down. 
obviously that flow in order for it to move and terminate on that. Yeah, they share the they share the Do same they share like a group certificate or something. They have an yeah, individual. They're group effectively or? the same router. Yeah, effectively. Well, right, but they, so normally in certificates, your unique certificate per router, right? Now these guys share the same one. So they share they share either a group one or they share the yeah. same certificate in order to be able yeah. to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's shared. Uh, so, um, but you know, I guess you could actually configure if you wanted. I mean, I don't go through the work, but I guess you could go in and configure your own certs on an individual router, and then yeah, they'll can. have uh, attachments. So you could. Um, but again, so I guess you know that's that's usually anyway, well, that, so, it, that sort of displaces the whole individual flow thing because then you don't you you won't fail you won't fail over for state. But that's then part of the metadata, right? Uh, but that's that's that'll be for conductor connectivity for um, again so access not from, to the model. So not from yeah. router to router, but that's just router to con to conduct. That's like a it's like a peering relationship, <clears> really. Um, it's more than a peering relationship. They're doing actual um, session synchronization between them. So there's a there's a we call it a dog leg that could be like a router to router interface that's like a peer kind of just the group one that we And then there's the state synchronization. Yes. And that says if I see the same five tuple coming out on the other node then I know what to do with it already and can continue to send the flow. Okay. So it, there's a lot of work that went into it. I'm yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, it is but it is stateful. Um, but now the router contains things only like service routes, um, you know, peers um, routing instances, so BGP, uh, OSPF, you know, routing protocols, things like NTP. So, um, you know, those are on a per router basis. But where it gets interesting is now I've got global tenants that I can I can define, and it's kind of like if you really want to have you know network one through a hundred and have tenants that are network one through a hundred, that's kind of like today's way. Um, if you want to take advantage of a global data model, you could do things like. Every router has a guest Wi-Fi interface, and now that is a tenant. You could say every Wi-Fi, you know, NAT, you know, coming into me is a slash particular slash 32, and you can literally define that to be the tenant. Uh, you could take an interface and then break down tenants uh, with different subnet prefixes to identify traffic. But that could be global, right? You could literally take um, an address that doesn't exist, uh, and V6 addresses. I've, it's just, this is one of the setups I have. And then that is a tenant, uh, or actually that could be a service address, and you can literally recognize that address globally and then handle it you know, specifically. So uh, tenant, um, in my you know, setup, I do things like desktop, or it could be a satellite client. Um, LDAP servers are global. Um, and uh, you know, service, um, AWS web servers, Azure East uh, you know, web services, uh, maybe I want to have a service function chain before I send it into my cloud resources. That could be a service. Um, I could send it straight into the private VNet. You could have you know the traditional 3,000 application box.com type of stuff. Um, obviously, I do you know different uh, different conductors and such. Security policies, right? So those can be global. Um, adaptive encryption, uh, you know, internal or unencrypted. Uh, those are kind of the basic ones that I could think of. Um, uh, service policies can be global. So forward error correction, I want to do copies of voice packets on two links. Uh, you know, different failover, you know, approaches. And, and this is where the vector, secure vector routing comes in. So I could have a vector for LTE and a vector for MPLS. And I say, well, I'd rather, you know, it, it's kind of like link coloring, you know, if you think of it that way. And, and uh, you know, I want to prefer these, these types of links and then fail over to the, you know, the uh, subsequent links. Um, and I just, you know, Office 365, you could have your own policy for that. Um, you know, traffic profiles, um, that's just queuing and setting up your queue uh, allocation. And then we've got some pre-canned service classes that are global. That kind of simplifies your QoS config. Um, you know, I know that's not always in everybody's interest, but um, you can really, you know, like, by, uh, you know, just by default, assign different traffic types to, uh, you know, to uh, to uh, service classes. So that, you know, the power of a global tenant and service data model where all the routers inherit, uh, you know, the notion of, you know, services and prefixes is, is quite powerful. Um, so I don't know, does that help with the config side of things? Um, it's actually relatively straightforward. I, I'm still, <laughs> I, I still feel, I'm starting to understand some of the concepts, right? Some of the pieces. I guess my, my question still is I'm not I'm not understanding how everything. Uh, I actually don't actually. So I'll be honest. I don't actually understand how you set up 
anything to actually route anywhere because you didn't show me any part of that. Am I missing? Yeah, that, that's kind of what I'm missing. I'm, I'm just like, there's, I'm hearing, I'm hearing what the benefits are, right? You're, you're telling us what we can do, and I, you know, well, things in there. But we're I'm all not, router people, network people. Think in so, terms so of Dan, having a router, them, right? Show them how one service is configured and uh, yeah. pick one. Well, well, I, I mean, I'll say if you want to configure like a traditional router, you could put a, a quad zero service. Sure, show us how. Uh, or I probably so have some of those. Way. Like I like uh, or one or the other. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't care. I just don't know how to actually. All right. Where is some way uh, quad quad zero service? Well, the interesting thing is you can have like I've got Internet Azure East, so I want to egress Azure East, right? Um, so I defined a service called Internet Azure East, right? Um, you know, service group. If I want to give it, you know, that's for more accounting. Um, if I want to uh, uh, source that when I get there. Right? So when I get to Azure East, if I want to source that, I could do that. So that's, that's a, a component of a service. Mm -hmm. um, and I say, if the network interface is configured to source that, then do it. Otherwise, maybe not, right? Um, now I've got, uh, oh, again, there's a quad zero, right? A service address. And you can have a whole list of addresses. OK, so this gets, this gets created in Central. And then it gets pushed down to all of the devices. Pushed so all, all, of, all of the 128. Router in that authority. In that authority. Understand that this service now exists, mm -hmm. and now if I have traffic that hits a 128 router, it's going to look at the policy and say, "Well, the first I want thing to the service." Whenever the sometimes first... I equate it to a groomer, right? So you want to have traditional routing. You want to have BGP and go to the underlay. That is there as well, and I don't think we need to review that. No, no. If you want to override that for a particular tenant, and I didn't quite get down there, um, so for. Azure VNet 2, I give it internet access. For kernel, I just had some kernel stuff I wanted to give internet access, and a couple of LANs, and that's my mobile network. So, so, those are tenants. so when I plug that thing in, and it peers with another router, it's going to inherit the internet Azure East policy, and my traffic will, be, will egress Azure East, quad zero. Anything that doesn't match another service. Now if I have something that I want to handle. So now think of you got this like, Fabric of routers, but if I want to take a flow and send it somewhere else, I just define another service. So I can do a, I can do a, um, I have a demo conductor. I use this again to solve my own problem. So I had one problem where I was like, I don't have a public address. I've got this thing in my private resources, and I want to uh, anything coming in AWS on a public address. Actually, this is that public address. Don't hack it, uh, or you could hack it. It's it's actually hardened. So. Uh, that's probably a challenge to some. Anyway, uh, so now I take that, those flows in, right, and, uh, and I send TCP port 443 on a very granular basis. I've defined now to be my demo conductor, so, so, right? Uh, and it's this very specific address, 1 slash 32 address, port 443. Yeah. I snatch it, because that's an added address in AWS. I snatch it. and. Uh, and then now I route it through the fabric to my private data so, center. So, so imagine that you have a, a route that not only includes a slash 32-bit address, but also includes the port number. Any other, and, uh, any other port number would be routed a different way. Right. Yeah. And the only thing, actually, I only grant, I sort of put it through additional security controls. So the only thing that's granted access to the actual demo conductor is the IDS. So. Right. So services, all of this are all defined in central. Mm -hmm. They all get passed to all routers who are on net. Mm -hmm. As soon as a new router comes on net, it's going to learn about the services and whatever within the right authority. Yep. Um, once I know about the services, then as I am forwarding traffic, I'm making a decision about whether or not this is a service that I know about or whether it's just well, a general route. So when a packet comes into the router, the very first thing we, we do is figure out what tenant it's associated with. Okay. Okay. And that essentially cuts all the routes down to only those ones available for that tenant. That, so okay. this is the security piece? Correct. Right, okay. So, and the tenant definitions are you can maybe oh, VLAN, you know, or yeah, prefix. They're, they're typical. Yeah, things. yeah. Typical. We can we can define it. How you could have multiples on the same interface, so I could do the slash twenty four and then take some slash thirty twos and give them different access. Yeah, it's the best so longest most match. Yeah, yeah, the most specific. Okay. Yeah. So we define the defend the tenant, and the tenant gets particular has a certain set of routes. Yep. Essentially, that yep. you can look at it. Is this the view that you wanted? To well, yeah. I mean, so like guest Wi-Fi. So you think in terms of VRFs, right? I'm in a VRF and I have access what? to other places in that VRF. But I can have guest Wi-Fi could be a slash 32 uh, source for my, you know, my access point. 
and I want to grant it access. These are these are interface. These services can be service routed or load balanced to other interfaces anywhere in the network. So I gave it access to server two and server three, for whatever reason, WebEx, um, you know, OneDrive based on TLS certificates, right? And then it goes into the internet through the firewall. Now the blue things are ser are uh, tenants. Oh, and DNS is a fun one because yeah. you can take port 53, snatch your port 53 address uh, on any address, yeah. so somebody could figure yeah, 8888, well yeah. snatch that, and I route it to my DNS proxy. Sure. And the blue things are Which can be on another router somewhere else, or I can load balance it to DNS proxies elsewhere. And these blue things now are Now you get to the power of the uh, service the, the data model. Thick, and then this shows you what that tenant guest Wi-Fi can reach, right? Because the green ones are the services and the blue ones are the tenants. So controller's pushing all this down, and then the only thing that's exchanged router to router is that cookie. That as, as a new flow gets created, that's and it will state, contain a representation via the that cookie. It's guess Wi-Fi yep. going to server three, correct? And, and then that is this security policy, which right. implies, uh, you know, again, which, security which is just for an ephemeral state table in the receiving router to know that when I receive traffic on this flow, this is how I'm supposed to treat. Right. Yeah. As soon as that flow is gone, you should go back to your other demo because you might miss the time. Uh, well, uh, yeah, time wise, are we? Yeah. Uh, oops. Are we really? We're. Uh, no, I know. There, yeah, there you go. All right. We've got about half an hour left. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Anyway, so, so now, so now again, the power of the data model, the service that I just snatched out of the enterprise private data center, was on my private data center address, right? And now I define the service to be that slash thirty two. It could have been. A, I do have v four and v six in the setup. Um, it could be any address. And now I say I want to load balance that service now across my private and you know, a new service route that's been, uh, that's come up now in my AWS. So again, as many egresses, we can make policy choices. Uh, so you, so could, you effectively uh, move that, you move some of that load to AWS while without. It's live yeah. and it literally is running from, yes, my private data center and just spun up on the, one, on the 120T in AWS and then starts hitting your applications that you've deployed in AWS. Um, again, that could be as granular as port 443 for a particular IP or, you know, slash 128, uh, uh, or, you know, uh, could be some routes. Um, I didn't have to, like, throw BGP back in because I just, that packet went through a 128T router, hit a service that I cared about, right? If it didn't, it might just route. But it hit something that I cared about, and that's a prefix that says this was port 443 for a particular address. And then I can take that, and then we balance the sessions amongst available service routes or do a failover. Of, um, and a service route could be local, so you could do internet breakout, and that would be a directional uh, firewall. Or you could do it remotely across the fabric, sending metadata. Um, or both at the same time. But what about your hardware? Is all this happening on your own ASICs and things, or? No, this is software. So we love Intel. Uh, it's just know, software. They, it, keep in mind, you do a little extra work with that metadata on flow setup, and now you literally have a forwarding table that, like I always say, there's no, no faster forwarding profile than a NAT, right? We're not encapsulating in a tunnel. Now we're simply changing the address to be the router's address interface IP right. or the next hop. Router interface IP. This is like powerful stuff. I'm yeah. having more fun in networking. Obviously, I I don't think I've ever built so much as I have in the last couple of years. Uh, but I'm having more fun with this than uh, than I have in the past. I shouldn't have taken you. But I think I think some of the questions is like the hardware. So you've talked about the hardware, and you've mm -hmm. talked about how you know you were saying in your presentation earlier you can write all your own commands and all that stuff. I think that's the stuff we're trying to figure out and see. I mean, you guys are doing a great job with presents presenting. It's just there's some of that stuff that I think has been talked about and whatever. And just so let me just talk about the hardware quickly. Um, so we have hardware partners. Uh, we prefer Intel because we use DPDK, but you can run us as a VM on any hardware. The performance you get, let's say you have a two-core or a four-core Intel Atom processor with, let's say, four or eight gig memory, you'll get about a gig throughput through it. You can also run us coreless uh, on a single core, but then, of course, performance will be lower. If you run us, and like when I said, performance increases linearly with scale, if you run us on a 10, 12-core um, machine, you get about 10 gig. If you run a 22-core machine, you get about 100 gig. So it scales linearly with, with uh, how much cores you will give us. Having said that, if you run us a virtualized in, let's say, Amazon or 
or Google or any of the, the public clouds depends on how much exactly the same thing. It depends on how much cores you will give us there. It depends on the size of the EC2 instance you'll give us. So if you give us there four Xeon cores, obviously you'll get very high performance. Um, it scales linearly with cores. We like DPDK and Intel, obviously, because we're using DPDK. We program the hardware. So there's no, no once, once the flow is established, we program the hardware. Everything is hardware forwarded after that. We don't really participate in any of the forwarding decisions. Um, Except you know, when there's route changes, then of course, when there's a failover, there's an interrupt, we will, we will again participate. That's about the hardware. Um, your other question was on, um, uh, sorry, what was the other, other, uh, other? I guess just trying to understand how it's all coming together. I mean, you know. You've right, about, so, so, so what? I what? We've, we've talked about the config and we've seen like the, the manager stuff. What about the end devices? What, what all's going on and how do we, Right. So, so what, 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 like, like, like Don just showed. So yeah, they're showing the small one, right? So, uh, so traditional DPDK, right? So Intel DPDK, you've got tools to do you know, fast forwarding. Well, so we have, we, we, we seed the hardware with some DevOps tools. I think Salt is a, is a Salt. Salt minion, and that's done by um, our, some of our partners like Arrow or. Um, we have others, we have a bunch of them. And, and and the customers can buy it from a web store, not from us, but from one of our partners. And with the uh, hardware seeded with the correct uh, salt minion, it downloads the right version of Linux. We use, um, what do we use? Uh, yeah, you can search Centos. Google Arrow and 128 yeah. technology, and you'll see a What's storefront that yeah. is like an appliance. If you want to buy it as an appliance, and then you can say, give me my conductor IP, and it'll pre-stage the conductor IP. It'll feel like an appliance, but you know, I mean, it, you know, again, that you can install that same software in in another environment. And you know, we're we're not we don't 100 percent rely on DBDK. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of folks do the KNI kernel network interface, yes. and uh, and that gives you a ton of flexibility uh, to run on on hardware. Um, we can take KNIs and throw them into containers, and and um, you know, and uh, and do do uh, you know, you don't lose the Linux uh, you know kernel tricks that you might other want to use otherwise want to use. You know, in one of my demos, I'd spin up a, um, you know, I, I install Docker on the 128T and then throw in some containers and then do, you know, live container networking. So um, it, it's, you know, that's, there's some openness to the platform if you, if you choose um, to, you know, to grant access, um, you know, or you can buy it as an appliance. Yeah, just to bring it together, um, so, you get this appliance either it's a you get a white it's a white box uh, we don't have make any hardware so it's a white box you either run it run it ship it with the salt minion or you ship it and you install our software on it um, by other means of course the salt minion will do a call home download the software it will get the IP address of the conductor get the configs once it gets the configs so what Don showed you the tenants and services it knows all the tenants and services, who has access to what. It also has global policies like he showed, BFD settings, uh, BGP settings, and other things, which it will get. Once it gets all of these, all of the routers know now how they're connected and whom they're peering with, like where the upstream 12080 routers are and where the services are located. So when a, when a packet hits any of the 12080 routers, it's gonna take, it's gonna figure out, okay, this service is located in that router and I need to go there. So then he'll put the metadata, establish a flow and then send packets and communicate with it. As soon as the, the flow is, 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 is over, it, it shuts down the flows. You can run any of our routers, like he mentioned, in HA mode. So they use a high-speed in-memory database to sync all the session state among themselves. So it doesn't matter if you're on an MPLS link on one router and you're in HA mode with another which has LTE. When it comes back from the LTE network, the sessions are already in sync, the session state. Uh, and the session tables are in sync, and so it will accept that cookie and then say, okay, it's based on that router and forward it out. Um, Point to make on the, we used to do Cassandra, right? But, you know, which is nice for a distributed database, but kind of slow and clunky to some degree. Um, InfluxDB made for time series data, you know, lightning fast, uh, so we're really loving that change. Um, and and. And so now we can keep more session-based or flow-based uh, data right on the router then that can be queried through APIs, right? So when I hit this conductor, um, you know, let's just say I'm interested in, we probably had some TCP retransmissions. Uh, so actually now as that shifts over to the internet, now you see TCP retransmissions because that's a real world. Um, but now I want to know, um, 
you know, you know let's look at uh, you know which service had TCP retransmissions. Um, Click on it, you know, right there. Nine for the Elastic Service, right? Because that's the one that went over to the cloud. That was for my Elastic Service, and it went across my AWS Central Internet interface, 18 retransmissions per second. Try that on a centralized analytics database. That's on the router. So, and we're querying that through APIs. So now I've got congestion on an application. Uh, that's going to show up as a service-based parameter but I've got congestion on an interface, and that's, on, that's an interface parameter. And if I want to add other parameters, I just add a new chart, um, you know, whatever I want to call it. But you've got tons and tons of, you know, if I care about TCP, you know, bandwidth, packets received, device interface, network interface. So that would be, you know, subnets, TCP retransmissions, bandwidth for these TCP services. So you can keep a lot more data you know, on that hardware and, and age it out um, at a rate that's according to what you've got as far as storage and such so goes. You can export via IP fixes. A lot of our routers are in places where there's, so every company has their sort of sweet spot with when they try and get established because who's going to buy, like who's going to buy from a company that doesn't have any customers, right? And so we've been discovered as a company that has great solutions for, for uh, 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 low bandwidth or lossy links such as satellite or T1 or, and so a lot of our early or first sales were uh, tied to people that have very thin skinny pipes or problems related to, uh, 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 and so running, pushing all that analytic data over those pipes is just not, it's not it just doesn't, com doesn't compute. This model allows us to collect all that data on the router and only in the event that you're interested in it, that you can pull it with rest, rest, rest calls and so it, it's actually, works really nice and you get all the you can see all the detail that you get and you only get what you're looking at when you go when you're looking at it so it's, it's actually are you quite doing um, containers outside of what you're doing here as well so on the, the 128 router itself are you, you having a container to do all the a BGP container and OSPF container or any other services that are running well so the first one so the advanced first one's the conductor uh, so that's got containers for subconductors then that have individual authorities those could have different software versions, right, for a different tenant or group of routers that you want to manage. So it was kind of important to start there. Um, and yeah, we, 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 we're some, interested uh, in going that way. If you looked at our internal product roadmap, I think you'd see some of those kinds of concepts in, in the in the future of the product. Um, we currently run uh, FRR. Our, our some things you want routers. to bring together for performance, and other yeah. things you you can break apart for isolation. So we're still working our way through that. But yeah. it's, I mean, architecturally, it's not that hard. Gotcha. Yeah. But it, it is based on, our BGP is the FRR and... Oh, uh, actually, yeah. routing does run in a namespace. And yeah. So, okay. Um, all right, so I think there was mention of multicast. Um, oh, well, uh, yeah, before I leave here, actually, um, you know, the power of session-based information, right? So now I can see it's not just an IP address and a port number, right? I care about what that IP address represented, right? Which can be the service name that I gave it, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, naming interfaces, naming subnets, routing with words. And now you got tenants, right? My Azure VNet is apparently talking outbound, which is interesting. So that's probably going out and doing some kernel updates or something like that. Um, because uh, I did grant that VNet, as you saw, access to the internet, so uh, something to double check. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, I hope you won't forget. Because I didn't do that. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, anyway. So uh, anyway, you got a session identifier. Uh, that session identifier is carried in the metadata. So now I know where the session came in the network, and I can look for a next hop uh, if it's in another router and correlate that session ID. Uh, one of the things we want to do is then chain the path of the session that, you know, show where it goes. Uh, so that's, um, that's a pretty cool one. Um, it's got, so your FIB now is kind of similar, right? It looks like um, tenants and services, right? And you may have one or more next hops, which are essentially your waypoints or segments, you know, next hop segments. Um, but you do have a traditional FIB. This probably doesn't have much. Um, 
else? It's got a little more than I thought. Services can be represented just for, uh, um, you know, for kernel, uh, uh, you know, kernel routing. A service is, is represented as a black hole route. Otherwise, your routing table doesn't have a route for that. Um, and then you could do again. You could have BGP interfaces and or BGP routes that are uh, also used if you had like a a, a wide open. Uh, uh, again, a wide open service slash, you know, quad zero that you want to just route using BGP. It'll say, okay, I, you know, I accept this packet. Um, you know, should I, you know, and you could then, you know, fall back to the rib, uh, you know, for routes to reach that, uh, that destination. So it's kind of a blending of uh, traditional and um, a more intelligent uh, fib. Um, I could probably, I don't know if I have anything in here, like, I didn't call a multicast service, but, uh, I don't know, what do I have in here? Maybe something Azure. Uh, so I can look at my Azure routes. And these are my private VNets in Azure. One of them is my service chain. One of them is my actual private Azure VNet. Um, any port, any protocol can get to it. Um, you know, again, it's a, a tenant, any service. You can look at your tenant interfaces. These are a little bit, Tenants and services, you could, if you want a construct, you could kind of think of them a little like a VRF. Um, I'm doing IPsec with the Azure Virtual WAN service. Um, so these are, you know, essentially ingress uh, tenants that are on that local router, which will then uh, be able to access services that I've defined. Um, one of the cool things I think about our just our portal is the performance of this thing. I mean, it's just um, uh, if you want to, you know, I want to look at everything that had to do with BGP. We're literally doing uh, so it's not just REST like GraphQL, right? So, like the good guys can uh, can construct a GraphQL query that's screaming lightning lightning fast to figure out, uh, you know, what you want as BGP. Uh, anything that goes with multicast. Um, and there's other guys that are like, you know, CLI forever. Um, but I, I kind of like the, um, the UI for some of the, you know, just the, the, the search. And so, so what he's doing here is he's searching through the CLI or the JSON document that is the, re is the result of the CLI. Right. The CLI. So AWS Central, it's, it's actually not running multicast there. But I do have multicast video services uh, running on the ZTP node, which is uh, spun up with Ansible. Um, the Atlanta node has multicast sources, uh, or uh, sorry, destinations. And uh, that's probably running uh, that multicast traffic. I think there was a question about that. Like I have, um, uh, if I go to my router dashboard for Ashburn, that is primarily multicast traffic. I can look at my top 10 sessions, but that's, um, you know, number one is 2.6 meg of multicast traffic running. Uh, we'll do the replication. Actually, got a doctor of multicast right here, so. Uh, so it's replication, so it's not actual multicast. No, it's multicast. It's, multi so it's 224, somewhere in there. It's uh, IGMP join. Yeah. And then, actually, again, we'll get the doc. Yeah, so what, what we do is basically we are not using PIM state or PIM forwarding in the core. Uh, what we are doing is basically when a packet comes in, it will establish two sessions based on the bifurcation point, and then it will so send out send the two packets. packets out. Two packets out on different interfaces, and that's how we'll do the multicast. And obviously, as IGMP join comes, then this, this thing will get pruned. We can, we can also not... join on the other side. So we can actually uh, join two multicast domains uh, across the Internet. Yeah, so, I'm also yeah. concerned about this yeah. scalability because what you do multicast for is typically to avoid correct, right, okay. correct, right, right. But there, we have a lot of customers that use multicast for weird ass stuff. That's all I mean, and and, and it's not about it's not about volume of traffic it, or even saving bandwidth. It's just weird. So, <laughs> but you could do a, a join to the existing multicast, or I'm sorry, MPLS network if you were using multicast on the MPLS network. Yeah. But if you now want to move stuff over to internet based, um, you're going to have to have replicators that are you know that you control. Right. The, the, yeah, the difference between traditional multicast and us is you need, uh, in traditional multicast, like PIM or BEER, you need the entire domain to be under sure. to understand. In our case, you don't need that because we're going to be an overlay, so we're going to just bifurcate. It might not be the perfect multicast tree because you don't have us everywhere. If you have us everywhere, the multicast tree will be perfect. But other than that, 
we will, it doesn't matter if your underlay understands multicast or not. All we need is our routers and it will multicast to them.